So welcome to Crack and Vault. Today we're going to be interviewing John Mason, a professional storyteller who's doing a PhD in storytelling and landscapes. And we're going to be touching on British mythology. So welcome, John. Hello, good to be here. Thanks for having me again. No problem at all. So let's jump straight into it and let's talk about one of the stories you tell, and that's around the British creation myth. So tell me, how did you come about your story? It, it's, it's, it is kind of speculation, I have to say that right from the very start, but I was convinced that there ought to be one, that there must be one that's um, just been lost to, to the historical record, really. And and um, n not just because I thought in principle one would expect it, but I was convinced that there, there must be a missing one because of because ultimately of similarities between um, the fragments of pre-Christian religion that are supposed, you know, that we, we can assume are there in um, Welsh medieval tradition, and similarities between those and more substantial traces of pre-Christian belief that can be found in Irish traditions and also in archaeological discoveries from Gaul and Roman Britain as well. And so there was this this um, apparent sort of lacuna that I've, I've kind of filled by a little bit of educated guesswork, really. Um, so, OK, so, so where does your story begin? Well, so my, my story begins with something which uh, yeah, there's a lot of people will have come across in other Indo-European bodies of mythology with a conflict between two groups of gods, for want of a better word, really. Although the way I tell it is um, I, I actually use the, the words of the gods versus the giants, just like you get in Norse stuff. But I'm not drawing on Norse stuff there. What I'm drawing on is two different things, really. So in Irish medieval writing, then there is this tradition, which also turns up in a few um, orally transmitted folk tales as well, that Ireland went through a series of invasions and the most recent bar one, because um, the most recent one is the Gaels, is the, the, the Irish people. The most recent one before that was the Tuhade Danan, the, the people of Dan, Danu. And it's generally accepted these days by academics that um, Danu represents a mother goddess figure, um, potentially with quite a broad spread. I mean, people will sort of reasonably confidently say that um, her name gives us the River Danube, the River Don um, in the north of England, uh, maybe even the River Dnieper in, in um is it Russia? I know it's it's way out in the east, isn't it? Um, and yeah, uh, so so arguably quite a quite a big figure um, in Indo-European mythology and her people um, include lots of characters who are identified as gods um, basically but they, uh, they 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 arrive in Ireland um, from out of the north it says um, in, um, in a cloud of mist and they bring with them all their arts and crafts and, and they are truly skilled in the ways of art and craft and magic poetry um, and they're also warriors the warrior nobles of pre-christian irish society yeah they they come and take over ireland and but ireland is not empty at the point they arrive there are other groups of people living here first they have a a big fight with um the, their predecessors the, the previous wave um who who the book says came to ireland who are called the fur bog um, and then they have a big fight with these beings who it, it, it's a bit shadowy, but it seems like they they have always been there. And I'm I'm must admit, I'm not going to try and pronounce the actual Gaelic name, but it's generally anglicised as Fomorians. Um, and the Fomorians are very much these sort of chthonic um, uh, Slight, well, they are, they are slightly hostile and malevolent in that story, but not 100% so. And in, in, in some ways, they are presented as sort of just another group of people who operate much like Irish society used to do. Um, but uh, they are interpreted as, as sort of representatives of uh, these more primordial kind of elemental forces. So the, the, the sea they have connections with, but also... It's revealed as the story goes on that it, they have the knowledge of how to make the crops grow. 
Um, so they are powers of fertility and, and arguably life and death, really. So agricultural. And, uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, in, in their way, yes. Uh, and and so there are various different um, tellings of it um, in the literature. The, the, the main book is called The Book of Invasions, but it's, um, there are other texts which cover the Battle of Moitura, um, in which the the gods, the two Hatadanan and the Fomorians have their final confrontation in which the gods win. But a treaty is agreed uh, where the Fomorians are allowed to go under the ground into the, the fairy mounds, um, the, 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 which are the Bronze Age and Neolithic burial mounds still visible across Ireland. And uh, yeah, the people who told this story at the point that it was written down interpreted those as being ways into this world beneath the surface world, which was given to the Fomorians to live in. And the Fomorians give the Tuhade Danan the secret of making the crops grow. And you can interpret that, and you can tell that as a storyteller. I've told that in different ways. Um, these days, I sort of make an ecological thing out of it about sharing the land. But I suspect, actually, really, in, in a more literal reading of the text, would be about how great the gods were for grinding their enemies under their feet. But that that actually grinding under the feet is a good link onto the bits of the suggestions of story elsewhere that I, I've built on, which I can go into if that yeah, would be useful. Yeah, before we do that, just yeah. to uh, let people know, you've got a CD coming out, haven't you, John? Oh, I so have, audio yes. books. Um, so John usually travels the country uh, and goes to festivals, storytelling. Do you want to tell people about the CD that, that you've got coming out? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so it's it's um, a handful of my favourite um, folk tales to tell from Sussex, where I live now, from Berkshire, where I grew up, and from North Wales, where I have spent huge chunks of my life, and it's a big part of my life. So uh, it, uh, they are... Um, Small scale folk tales, but with deep, deep, deep um, emotional wells underneath them, really, and and possible links to um, yeah wider mythology as well. And so included in there is one aspect of um, my my take on a British creation myth, um, drawing on the Irish material I've mentioned, um, bits of Welsh stuff, bits of Gaulish stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Let's let's go on a little bit more about the Battle of Matoya. Then, um, is that where Lud comes in, or maybe jumping the gun here? Ah, yes, yes. Okay, well, not quite. No. So, so um, Lud. Those of you who don't know, is is um, the name of a, a mythical king from English medieval um, literature, but. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I know. Um, but English, as in sort of the Anglo-Norman high medieval kind of um, world, that's that's where people start. People like Holland's Head and Geoffrey of Monmouth, yeah. I think, might be the earliest one we have. Um, write stories about this guy Lud, who was supposed to be uh, one of a line of kings, descendant of Heli, is what Geoffrey Monmouth says. But um, other other people have said belly, which brings us into Welsh traditions, because one theory, and I kind of subscribe to it, is the idea that Lud was borrowed into English literature from Welsh myth. Geoffrey of Monmouth was an Anglo-Welsh monk who wrote the history of the kings of Britain, which was all just a great fictional romp, really. He always claimed that he was drawing on a certain book in the old British tongue, which he may or may not have been doing. But in medieval Welsh tradition, then there are references, and only references, to a king Llyth, which is spelt double L U double D. So um, to, to look at it, similar to Lud for an English speaker. And yet, yeah, so the, the supposition is that Geoffrey drew on Llyth to create his character Lud. It's been pointed out to me recently that actually the, the manuscript of Geoffrey's book is earlier than the earliest manuscript referring to Cleave that we have, but uh, that was Jeremy Hart, I should say, who's a very good folklorist and very, very good uh, at keeping us um, historically rigorous. And he's quite right, but um, I still think it likely that even though it's later manuscript that the Welsh thing comes from, it's a, it's an older tradition that's being yeah. drawn on. That makes um, sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, hopefully. Um, so basically, um, one of the references to Schlieth calls him Schlieth Silverhand, Schlieth Flau Erreint. And in the Irish myths that I was talking about earlier, then the king of the Tuha de Danan, um, at least at one point in, in the cycle of stories, is called Nuda Agatlau, which means Nuda Silver Arm. And obviously the first name is quite different, but the second name is very suggestive of a, of a, of a connection. And lots of the characters in these in Welsh myth, medieval stories and Irish myths are believed to be cognates, as it's called. Um, so is Lud the same as Nodden? With this Arguably, silver arm? yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I tend to think so. Yes. So, so Nodens is a, a god of Roman Britain that we know was worshipped and because that we know this because we have inscriptions, Latin inscriptions dedicated to him um, in a few different places. But the main one is a big shrine in a place called Lydney in Gloucestershire. So again, the, the, the names suddenly start coming in. Now, again, it seems to be generally accepted that the Nodens figure is the same as um, Nuda in Irish tradition. And the, the, the way it connects back round to Lud or Sleeve is probably best summarised as a theory by an academic called John Koch, John T. Koch, who um, is a professor at Cardiff University. And the way he theorises it, and, and, and it seems reasonable to me, is that basically, if we imagine what the... Doing a, doing a bit of speculative linguistics um, and trying to recreate what the the name given to this character in um, Roman Britain would have been. So we've got Nodens, and if we assume it's the same as Nuda Argatlau, Silver Arm, then um, he's reconstructed the name Nodens Argantolamos, which, which would be Arganto, Silver, Lamos, Arm or, or Hand. I'm not sure exactly which the way he puts it. And his theory is that during the period of Roman occupation, um, then, well, it, this isn't just a theory. We know that at some point the Welsh language changed, Welsh being um, the surviving iteration of the ancient British Celtic language. There was a shift so that the adjective came after the noun instead of before the noun. And perhaps, I, I don't know for sure, but I think that that might have been under Roman influence. And so Koch's theory, therefore, is that at some point, then Nodens Arganto Lamos became Nodens Lamos Argantos, with Lamos for and now coming before the adjective, the adjective Argantos coming after the noun. Don't know that this is, uh, yeah. So, so, but, but what effect does that have? Does that make that Nodus army silver then? Or do... Well, sort of, but it would mean the same as silver okay. arm. It's just a different, different way of saying it. So, for example, in in modern okay. French, then then um, it, you, you put you'd say you know le chat noir, the black yeah, cat, the chat for cat, noir for black. Mean, uh, um, so, so if you translate it literally into English, then that would be the cat black. But, um, but that's not how it's understood. It's just okay. a different way of communicating the same thing. And, and, and this god, because he was also associated with healing, I believe, so the silver arm. Well, exactly, yes. Yeah. So it's, it's very suggestive. So at the site in um, Gloucestershire, Lydney, where there was this big shrine to this god, then um, one of the significant attributes that people seemed to give the god there was healing. And the story about Nuda, uh, the Irish god, the reason he's called Nuda Silverarm is because so he was a ruler of the Tuha de Danan and he was leading them in battle against the Formorians. And in one particular battle, he was facing off against a champion called Shreng, I think, um, who actually cut his arm off. And the rules for the Tuha de Danan, and I've seen it suggested in probably more sort of fictionalised um, takes on things, that this was actually a law in medieval, early medieval Ireland as well. I don't know if that's true, but the law cited in the tale of the Tuha de Dana is that the king had to be physically whole, had to be physically perfect, okay. which possibly all links to do with, with the idea of the, of the king 
being sort of symbolically married to the land and so the the land which on which everybody depends for for their livelihood um for their survival would suffer if the king himself oh. wasn't physically perfect and we, we can get on to that that's, later that's really interesting yeah because that, that really ties in with proto-indo-europeans and and the king the king you know would sacrifice you would have to be right. prepared to sacrifice his whole to save the land that was the whole point right. of the king Yes. Oh well, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. So, um, so, uh-huh. so this Lydney place in Gloucester. So, there's, um, I think uh, I've read that that's where Tolkien actually done some archaeology because there's a oh, mine really? there. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's so, amazing. So there's a hill locally known as as something like Dwarf Hill, something like that, and there's a mine in there built by the Romans, and Tolkien did some archaeology there and found loads of coins and things, and they think that um, helped influence some of his writing around the Hobbit. Ah. I'd never heard that. That's fascinating. So, um, yeah, so I'd like to learn more about that place because that's certainly because there's a Roman fort or Roman village or something there, isn't it? And I think local law has it now that it, it soon became forgotten that the Romans were there, and and the local legend is that was built by fairies. So it, it shows how ah, stories suddenly change from yeah in, in a space of a couple of generations. Um, yeah, it's it's fascinating the way that people do that, and they see any sort of big ramparts and things in the landscape as, as the work of previous magical things uh, it, which in fact actually brings us back to the um the the burial mound in ireland and the <laughs> idea that they were the where 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 the formorians went down underneath and then after mortal humankind came and displaced the gods then the gods themselves went down under there again and and so and that is why they are now called fairy mounds that's yeah. So, okay. So, but, uh, of, I didn't. Oh, I didn't sorry. explain about so the silver arm thing. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Okay. Then let's, let's go back to that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the idea was that so, um, because Nuda wasn't physically whole anymore, he had to abdicate the kingship, and uh, the person who was given the kingship instead of him was was a curious choice, as I've seen it written, um, a character called Bresh, who was half. To Hadadan on half Fomorian, and he rather, it seems, favoured the Fomorian side. Um, and the uh, heroes of the two Hadadan were put under oppressive terms of having to do all sorts of hard labour for the Fomorians, and the Fomorians were sort of withholding the. Um, or the suggestion is that they were withholding the growing of the crops and so the Tuhar de Danan were suffering. But then a particular healer of the Tuhar de Danan, whose name was Dean Kecht, um, created a silver arm for Noda to um, make him whole once more. Although there's another little story there where in some versions, actually, he still doesn't count because it's still just silver, even though he can move it. And actually, it's Dean Kecht's son, who enchants it to make flesh grow over it and make him whole Be once more. Again. The Anket actually kills his son because he's jealous. That, um, anyway, Nuda Argatlau, um, silver arm, healed and then can lead his people once more. Um, and so the fact that Nodens was uh, associated with healing is another particularly strong suggestion that they're connected. And going back to John Cox's idea, the, the theory is that, so Noden's name, Noden's Argantolamos, at some point became Noden's Lamos Argantos. And then purely because it's alliteratively satisfying, and in um, daily speech that became Lodan's Lamos Argantos. And that evolved into um, medieval Welsh as Schlith Schlau Ereint, Schlith Silver Hand. Um, and also gave us the name Lydney, which is an Anglo-Saxon name. But the idea is the Anglo-Saxons came along and already were in contact with a community that was still worshipping this god at that place. And so the Anglo-Saxons called it Lydan A, meaning Lydan's island, Lydney. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, that's so fascinating. Everything joined together. It's, it's quite complex, I know, and there's, a, there's an awful lot of ins and outs. But that that gives us a, a, a that gives me, you know, something to hold on to to try and fill that lacuna I was talking about, where we know this Irish stuff and the Gaulish stuff, which I haven't really mentioned. But a lot of the characters in the Two Hadadana, their names are very similar to gods that we know were worshipped in Gaul. Um, so uh, the classic one would be um, Lug, the Gaulish god who the Romans equated with Mercury right. because he was 
a master of all the arts was the way they put it um in the tale of the two hearted danan and the fomorians and there's his character lu l u g h lu mm -hmm. um who it, in some of the earliest stories was called lu samuel danach which means many skilled or, or something like that um and that's a big Part. He, he's just this hero who who is a poet and a, a, a smith and a magic wielder and, and a warrior and, and he can just do, do everything and incidentally he's um uh, half fomorian as well but he comes to the rescue and and um uh yeah it, nuda uh, abdicates a second time for a temporary period because he just recognizes that this guy is so amazing um we need him to lead us into our final battle the second battle of Mishura, um in which the two had to defeat the fomorians and make that truce so so if people want to read more about these stories in particular where would you send them to apart from listening to you obviously <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, well, uh, I would say, um, well, I always end up saying the Mabinogion because that's where I start and end with my storytelling, which is Welsh uh, mythological tradition in which there are characters who also make that there is Slay, the hero who may be um, a British iteration of Lug Lu. Mm. And um, and you will hear, uh, it, you will be able to read in that the story of Sleeve and how he saved his people from oppression, including the the loss of all their food supplies as well. And he was helped in this by his kinsman Slavelis, who apparently in at least one medieval manuscript, the name is written Slovelis. And so there is arguably grounds to see that as being another reflex of the Schley Lu Lu character. And so you have Lu helping Schleve Nodens to save the people from oppression, including not being able to eat. And and so that is, it's tenuous. That one I would quite happily put my hands up and be corrected on. But it it, it, it again it helps guess what it's might have killed them. Isn't it? It's very it is, exactly, yeah. Um, and in terms of the Irish material, well, th there are lots of retellings, like popular retellings of the Mabinogion. There are also popular retellings of the Irish material as well. But um, I think Lady Augusta Gregory, um, she certainly was one of the first to translate the Ulster story about the hero, Cucullin, um, which is a slightly later cycle of tales. I wouldn't be surprised if some of this stuff turns up in there as well, but bear with me a okay. second. This is one book where I first read a lot of these stories. So, um, Aileen O'Feelan, um, Irish Sagas and Folk Tales. It's quite an old one, but I bet you can find it on Book Depository or um, Biblio, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. or whatever um, online retailer Hello, you choose to. <laughs> so as part of all that explanation, we started talking about hills and fairies going in hills and gods going in hills. But I'm conscious or, or I know of one story you talk about where there's a king under a hill. Or the king that sleeps on the hill, which is really interesting, and I think also is associated with some kind of creation myth, or like sort of a British Isles myth. That's something that appears a lot. So, what's your take on that myth, and and anything you know around that? Yeah, well, I I, I do love that. It's such a uh, such an amazingly um, emotionally read story this idea that and you find it in various points around the british isles in in slightly different versions but the common theme is that under a particular hill then there is this king this hero sleeping sometimes accompanied by others um like his, his trusted warriors um and that this was the king who saved our nation um, in some point against from our enemies, whoever they might be, at some point in the past. But now he is resting and will come back when he's needed most. And it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's it really touches something deep down. And and exactly you'll find similar stories. And Michael O'Leary, who's an amazing storyteller, says that he's come across the same motif occurring in um, the canary islands um and i found a very similar story in a book by an anthropologist called james scott about his work in malaysia and um alan garn who i'll talk more about in a moment says that you can find variations on this all the way through europe and into russia as well right, um yeah. and so in some ways i i think pass partly what it what it reflects is a sort of human impulse to think, well, things are rubbish. 
but I bet there was a time things always used to be better than this thing. Yeah, it never used to be this bad. And guess what? Somebody's going to come back and make it better. We don't have to do it. We don't have to do the work. Somebody's going to come and make it better for us. We just have to wait. And and without any sort of um, criticism intended, you can actually see something of the Christian myth in there as well, can't you? With, with the, the Messiah who will return. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a sort of... To a certain extent, I think it's a Jungian thing, really. It it it, it speaks yes, of it's part of the human belief. condition, really. Yes, but, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, Alan Garner. So Alan Garner is an amazing author, truly amazing author. But yeah, so he grew up um, and has always lived pretty much um, in and around Alderley Edge in Cheshire, which is a particular mm -hmm. hill where there is a version of this story, which gets me excited because I used to live near there for a few years when I was younger. Um, and so that, that was probably why my parents first introduced me to Alan Garner's stories. And Alan Garner, is, like, he's, he, he's well worth reading and, and um, uh, he, his nonfiction work where he sets out his thoughts on storytelling and myth is fascinating as well. And so there's a, a book uh, called The Voice That Thunders. That's the one I remembered. That's the one there. Yeah, we go. that's the one you're in. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, yeah. The collection of, of his essays and lectures. Brilliant um, book. Absolutely. The way he writes, you're involved in his way of discovery. I, I really like that. Yeah. It's, it's like it's a whole way of feeling the world, isn't it? And it just it really sucks you in. It's incredible. Um, and he says in there, doesn't he, on a number of occasions, that like he, his sort of life's work is to dedicate his intellect, his grammar school given um, rationalist way of thinking the world, to the service of um, an older, sort of more intuitive, um, less rational, more mythological way of understanding the world. And so yeah, there's that. There's an essay in there, isn't there? Um, Oral so, history and applied archaeology in East Cheshire. Yes. Where catchy title. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And it is. It's a very sober academic article that he wrote um, a couple of decades ago, I think. But in it, he makes this incredibly convincing case for the idea that in um, Oddly Edge, at least, um, the sleeping king, the king under the hill is actually a, a remnant of Bronze Age religious belief. Um, he, mm -hmm. he sort of talks about walking the, the, to, the, to the locations mentioned in that version of the yes, story, yes. which are always mentioned in a particular order. And he manages, and he, and he says himself, you know, if you try drawing lines between things on the map, you can come up with all sorts of ideas. You can draw lines between... Um, stone circles or you can draw lines between post offices or, or phone boxes or something like that um and you can come up with all sorts of amazing theories so he's he's i think the way he puts it best is when he quotes one of his one of his old teachers as saying you should keep an open mind but not so open that your brain falls out uh, which i think is such a great guide for life but all that said he then proceeds to come up with quite a reasonable and very well reasoned argument that the 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 path walked by the characters in the elderly edge story is connected to the, the path of the sun across the sky as it would have been in Bronze Age times. And in these spots, then he finds Bronze Age archaeology is present. And one aspect of that version of the story is that there's a, a farmer who's riding across the edge um, with a white horse and a wizard stops him and convinces him to let him buy the horse, tricks him into um, letting him buy the horse. And the reason is that one of the warriors beneath the hill is without a white horse and it was all a pure white horse. So the horse must be given in order for one day the heroes to rise. And that is a detail that Alan Garner picked out, which I have then taken and run with, really, and come up with some other ideas, which which I can expound now. Please, so if you had, let's mention the word Uffington then, because that may... Yes, yes, Uffington, the indeed. So I, I had this incredible experience at Uffington a few years ago. And um, Uffington, for those who don't know, is a hill, which I still I, I get told off for this all the time. I say it's a hill in Berkshire. It's no longer in Berkshire. They redrew the county boundaries in the 70s and it's now in Wiltshire, I think, but it's it's at a point where Wiltshire and Berkshire and Oxfordshire all pretty much meet and it's almost right um, at the meeting point. Um, the hills are still called the Berkshire Downs and it is, uh, and at Uffington there is this hill figure, this this white horse 
carved into the side of the hill. And it is the first of the English chalk hill figures to have been securely dated as prehistoric. I can't remember the name of the technique, but it basically involves looking at when the uh, the last time that soil was exposed to sunlight. And they applied this to, they worked out that the the horse was actually, they, whoever had made it had dug trenches um, into the um, into the side of the hill, which have filled with more chalk as 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 just time has gone on, and the and the, the chalk hill slope has eroded. And so they applied this technique to the surface of the trench underneath the soil that had filled it. And so that told us when the trench was cut. And it is approximately a thousand BC, which puts us firmly in the late Bronze Age. So that's proper old. But nobody really has been able to say exactly what it's for, um, why it was built. Uh, people have said it was some sort of tribal territorial marker or something or presumably a ritual thing. But as um, Francis Lynch, my archaeology lecturer at university, once pointed out that archaeologists will often say something is ritual when we can't think of any other explanation for it. <laughs> But anyway, so I I grew up in Berkshire and I and I'd never been to the White Horse um, until a couple of years ago, uh, and I took my family and my parents on almost a pilgrimage for me. I was determined to go and visit it at Easter time of renewal, but as by coincidence, and I was just looking at it and re I've been reading about the archaeology and looking at the site and. I, loads of things that all came together and this wonderful Venn diagram of different people's ideas all came together for me and I suddenly had this thought that you know it's horrifically arrogant to suggest that I might have actually come up with an answer for the white horse but I have got an idea yeah. which I have shared I've done a whole storytelling show all about it where I tell the stories that I'm drawing on so my, my idea for the white horse connects to Alan Garner thus at the foot of White Horse Hill at Huffington, where the White Horse is. There is a much smaller hill that is very small and round with a very flat top, so small and round and flat that people thought it might be artificial. It's been confirmed that it is a natural feature, but the top is flat because of lots of people walking around on it um, in, you know, going back into prehistory that long ago, that, that long a length of people walking around on it. Um, and the hill is called Dragon Hill. And the there is a, there are two stories there are two stories associated with dragon hill and i would love to find out the provenance of these stories so if any if any of your watchers uh, um actually know anything about this then please do get in touch and we can give my my website and things but one story is that this was where saint george killed the dragon um, and there is, in fact, a, a patch of earth on the surface of the hill where the grass will not grow. And that, that's there now. The grass doesn't grow there. It's a bare white chalk patch of earth. And the explanation is that was where the dragon's poisonous blood spilled and it stained the ground and nothing can grow there. And the other story is that it's called Dragon Hill because this is where Uther Pendragon was buried after a battle with the Saxons. So this is where it gets a little tenuous, but I am th uh, thinking, OK, so Uther Pendragon, father in many medieval traditions, not all, but many, of Arthur, and both are depicted in those traditions as people who fought to defend the British against their enemies, to save the nation against the invading Angles and Saxons, of whom I am one. And, and then... In this story, Uther was killed after a battle with them nearby and was buried under the hill, which is a little bit king under the hill. The other thing is that I, I read this on, I think it was the National Trust website or the English Heritage website, um, that archaeologists investigating the site have said that the, the actual real reason why grass doesn't grow on that patch of earth on top of Dragon Hill is that there were fires lit there now going way back again i don't think i'm um it's wishful thinking of mine today we're talking about prehistory here fires lit there regularly a lot mm -hmm. now we couldn't say exactly when or why or anything like that, but fires and so here's me thinking okay so we've got the white horse we've got um the king the hero who saved us sleeping under the hill. We've got the idea that 
this was where the you know in christian iconography the dragon is the beast isn't it that that's satan that's evil that is the um and it was like take it back to persian stuff with tiamat this is chaos before the nice peaceful ordering of the world and so here this is the spot where the representative of order the hero the divine hero george killed the beast and the fire is there now in the Mabinogion, the Welsh legends, then we hear of Fiannon, who is a divine woman who rides a white horse. And she is associated with the horse. And in many episodes of, of the stories in which she occurs in the Mabinogion, then she actually has attributes that she is forced to act like a horse. And it is generally accepted, again, by um, academics, that her name comes from Rigantona, which is a reconstructed British name meaning Great Queen. And the theory is that she is a goddess, quite likely a goddess of sovereignty and the land. Again, bringing us back to Lud in a way and the, the marriage to the land. Um, she has a son. His name is Prideri. And in a couple of different episodes in the Mabinogion, then he is ca captured. He is stolen away, um, abducted by forces from the other world, the, the, the shadowy world of gods and the dead and magic and spirits, and arguably translated as the deep place within, which again makes us think of Fomorians. Mm -hmm. And so there's that older tradition, that, well, older? No, not necessarily, but that parallel tradition of in Celtic Britain, Celtic speaking Britain, the gods and the these primeval older beings fighting each other and the primeval beings being associated with the earth down within and there being a hero, Lou in that case, who comes and beats them. Um, in Gaul and parts of Germany, what's now Germany, then the Roman, Romanized, you know, the synthesis of Roman and local traditions, people can see what we call Jupiter giant columns, some of which still exist. The big Roman style column, and at the top of it is some sort of divine hero figure, sometimes armed with lightning bolts, riding roughshod over some sort of formless, shapeless kind of bear enemy which again makes me think of the gods associated with the sky in um, Irish tradition and their counterparts in Welsh tradition having solar associations, celestial associations, defeating the, the, power, the phonic powers beneath, mm -hmm. crushing the beast, the, the, the primordial chaos underfoot, like George and the dragon. Um, and so basically I thought of that, I was at, the white horse i was at dragon hill and i was thinking of this place where a hero might be sleeping this place where the beast was defeated and in alan garner's analysis of the elderly legend of the king under the hill then it's important that the white horse is given to the king to the heroes under the hill in order for them to be able to return one day and save us all again which makes me think of horse sacrifice, which we know happened from archaeology in Britain. And in um, Gerald of Wales, the Welsh monk talks about an Irish ritual in which the white horse represents the land and the king actually had to mate with the horse, which was then sacrificed and cut up and he sat in a stew and he had to drink this. Uh, anyway, um, and, and people have said that Gerald of Wales was horrifically racist about the Irish and so might have been exaggerating to a significant extent but people still give serious academics give credence to this sort of horse sovereignty goddess um ritual stuff going on um and so i'm thinking okay so was the the bronze age ritual that's elderly that we had to kill the horse in order to bring the hero back did the horse represent the sovereignty goddess Priannon, perchance under another name whatever who had to go to the other world, the land of the dead, in order to bring her son back so that the land could be saved once more. And so we have the defeat of the beast, the sleeping hero, the fires lit, maybe ritual activity, at the foot of White Horse Hill, where the Bronze Age White Horse was cut. Now, I am totally prepared for academics to tear that apart. And it is highly speculative. 
but I, I brilliant story. If it, if yeah, it's a good story. Yes. It's, I can see. Yeah, that is. Oh, I would love to listen to that as a whole one day. Mm. Um, but yeah, you're but you've got to put a stake in the ground. You know, for people. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I, what, yeah. what I should have said, I suppose, because it's probably got lost in that long explanation, is is the solar thing as well. The Alan Garner's thing of the, the, the elderly legend shouting the the sun crossing the sky, and and so my thinking is that the the, the sun is the hero, and the the darkness that was defeated is um, is is just the, the dark of night, really, and and the knowledge that it's the sun that makes the crops grow, crops grow. You know, we want the powers under the earth to let the crops grow for us. Um, and the uh, we know from Danish Bronze Age um, artefacts and uh, rock carvings that they had strong traditions about the sun uh, making its cycle across the sky and then going under under the water, as it was in their case. But, it, you know, a lot of Danish culture existed on a series of islands. Um, so water would make, you know, would be Egypt more part of the their world. And, yeah, there's a lot of that. And, and darkness. Well, and this is the really interesting yeah. thing, isn't it? Because yeah. because actually, yes, in Egypt, then you do have the, the, the tradition of um, Isis going and looking for Osiris, is it? Who's her husband who's been killed and cut up and her bringing him back. But there is also the tradition of um, Horus, who is a solar hero and who is their son, Isis' son, who goes across the sky and defeats the darkness and drives it away, but then dies and goes beneath the earth and fights his way through the underworld in order to return and keep us safe by driving the darkness away once more. And I read um, somewhere that you even have the same in Mayan tradition, where they have Jaguar, who does the same thing, drives the evil away, and then is, dies, goes beneath the earth, come, uh, fights his way through the underworld, comes back again the next day. And so I, I, I must admit that's almost to suggest that there was actually some sort of continuous historical tradition between Egypt, which is not Indo-European, and um, Celtic-speaking Britain and Ireland, and Denmark, which is not Celtic-speaking, but it is Indo-European, and the Mayans in Central America. That's that's a step too far for uh, me, Richard. The so I come back to the... Egypt I could live with a little. Yeah, just about, but yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but who knows, maybe, maybe, maybe the Mayan stuff, they are pyramids, but you know, people say that, don't they? But maybe, maybe that's where the Jungian impulse comes back in again, that it is just <laughs> about maybe it just shows how much of a human thing it is to, believe, to be yeah. scared of the dark and to to depend on that that cycle to make the crops grow um but it does make me think maybe there was a bronze age celtic speaking tradition in the british isles where the solar hero was the son of the white horse goddess of the land and he dies after having driven away our enemies and she goes to the world of the dead to bring him back yes 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 that is that is amazing can, can we just yeah. the, the, so, so one thing we spoke about before in one of our, our private chats we spoke about the frank's casket yes i don't know yeah. briefly so um for people don't know frank's casket is an anglo-saxon um war, i think it's war's ivory uh box. whalebone whalebone it's whalebone is it i know that because there's a riddle on it which explains uh, yes, what it's made it, of yes yeah um and, and the number of carvings runes and stuff and i think one panel you were saying may depict some yeah. of this yeah oh. so so um and this this was i was quite excited to stumble across this because i first found out about the frank's casket which is this anglo-saxon box um because one of the panels on it seems to be telling the, the tale of Wayland the Smith, um, yeah. uh, who turns up in um, Icelandic stuff is where we've got the most detailed version yes. of his story, but it, it also yeah. appears in Old English stuff. And incidentally, a mile away um, further down the ridgeway from Whitehorse Hill is the Neolithic burial chamber, which is known in more recent tradition as Wayland Smithy. Yeah. Uh, he's supposed to have, have lived there. So I was reading about Wayland Smith and said, oh, you can see him on this Frank's casket. But also on one of the other panels on the Frank's casket, apparently, is this picture of a figure who's either got like a sort of horse headdress on or actually is a horse, but is sort of sitting, sitting bipedally on um, something. It could be anything, as much as you interpret it in the picture. But one translation of the runes on it, and it is contested, but one translation of the runes on that panel says something like, here sits Hoss, which is a personal name, but would mean horse. Here sits Horse on the sorrow mound 
and I'm, it probably says something more, but I can't quite remember. But the, people, not just me, but um, apparently others have said, well, actually, hang on, in the Mabinogion and Rhiannon, the horse goddess, is uh, treated really badly, she's accused of killing her son when he first disappears, wrongly accused, and she's punished for this and, and goes through this punitive period of, of of immense sorrow and i think there might be more to the frank's cas- more to the line of runes on the frank's casket mm-hmm. which, which adds to the sense of um her suffering for something that's happened um and so yeah that it, 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 if that is a reference if that does fit in then it's curious as to why an old english runic inscription and carving from the area of york in the 800s 9th century Mm -hmm. should reflect this ancient british tradition yes and and to add a further twist yeah a further twist is that if you go to british museum the frank's casket on display that panel you talk about isn't the original panel Mm. so so that's it's actually a cast and the original panel is actually in an italian museum I locked away in a, on a second floor, I think it is, room that's only open weekdays in the tourist season. And you can hardly see it. But someone who's done some investigation looked at it and he says, by like looking at the original, you can actually see details not in the cast. And therefore, that may influence the runic inscriptions because some of the letters are actually fallen off the runic inscription of the one we've got in the British Museum. Mm. So... Who knows? There may there may be something more tantalising there if you if you look for <laughs> oh, lots of stories like that. So that's um yeah. yeah. So one thing we were we touched on was King Arthur. You can't talk about British mythology without a bit of King Arthur. Um, yes. And, and one of the things we know from King Arthur, or one one of the sort of plot lines, is about a lady in the lake who fixes a sword. Mm. And I know on your CD you have a story about a Welsh maiden rising from a lake. So are these things connected, and, and what is why are Welsh well, maidens coming out of lakes? Yeah, po- po- quite, well, Welsh maidens coming out of lakes um, are are quite a well established element of folklore. There's lots of stories from across Wales, which involve variations on the idea that a shepherd or similar is happens to be by this particular lake, and they tend to be about excuse me, uh, they tend to be about actual lakes that you can visit nowadays. The most famous one is um, Llyna Van Vach um, in South Wales, in, in the Brecon Beacons. Um, and and so the, the, the young lad, um, salt of the earth lad, um, is there watching over his flock or whatever, and he sees this beautiful maiden rise and step out of the lake they, they fall to talking or she approaches him and eventually they get married. But there's always some sort of prohibition, some taboo um, that places a kind of ritual condition upon their marriage. That if that's broken, then she, she's going to have to return to her land, her people under the lake. And, and the Welsh oral tradition holds that these people under the lake, they are the fairies. That, that's where the fairies live. That's one of the ways to where the fairies live. Um, so these fairy maidens are known to come from the lake, and in some versions, then they bring their, um, their all their cattle with them, and and all their other farm animals, which are of course bigger and healthier and more wonderful, and give more milk than than any of ours. And and she takes those with her as well. So I tell a version of that on my CD, and it's a version that I really like, partly because it's from a place I know very well. It's from near Beth Gellert in North Wales. Um, which is most famous for its tale of Gellert, the faithful hound, who was wrongly killed by Llewellyn and um, Prince Llewellyn, the great of, of medieval history. Uh, and it's a tragic story. But um, not far from there is a lake called Llyna Duachen, which means Lake of the Turves. Um, and Gerald of Wales, again, um, gives us the explanation for why it's called the Lake of the Turves, because he even he says in his day in the 12th, 13th century, thereabouts there was a a, a a floating island made of turf um in the lake it moved around and so we, we know it must be okay. a, a wonder it's magical this and and i tell the story of how that island came to be and and how it is connected with the the welsh lake maiden um the other reason i really like that particular version of the story is because it has a twist at the ending and i won't give away what that is but it's the I know so many versions of this story, and this is the only one 
which doesn't just end when the, the maiden has to return to the lake. It has a twist mm-hmm. to it, um, which is quite lovely. We well, have to um, listen to the CD then. Is that yeah, a the if CD? you listen to the oh, CD, okay. you'll hear it. But here's an interesting connection to what we were talking about earlier. So there's a chap called Gwillem Morris Baird. Mm-hmm. Um, although I haven't said about the, the Arthurian connection, which, you know, which I should. So, and that, that sort of um, presages what I was about to say. So, um, so Lake Maidens, obviously it is a lot like the, the, maid, the, the Lady of the Lake. And I know the Lady of the Lake first turns up in much later medieval writings yeah. and French medieval writings, I think, as well. Most of um, the King Arthur stuff. Pops yeah, up, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But um, uh, people say that it, 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 those those medieval romances did arise out of a whole sort of milieu of of oral traditions um which uh actually included ballads and tales which had been brought into france from Brittany, which was a you know celtic british speaking um principality and and they still maintained connections with cornwall and wales the celtic fringes of the british isles and so um these traditions probably spread by word of mouth all the, all the way there yeah maybe the people who came up with those arthurian romances were familiar with this idea of ladies coming from lakes maybe they were also familiar with the idea of swords being found in lakes because this is one thing we know from British Iron Age and Bronze Age archaeology is that um, the Celtic speaking Britons at that time would make votive offerings. They would they 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 seem to believe that their gods were in the waters. And this has been linked to um, climatic deterioration um, around that time. And the fact that, like I said about you know in Denmark, they lived on islands. So the sea and such like would have been a big part of the, the the conditions that define their lives that's where you think about your myths um in if if britain was becoming particularly wet in the iron age then um it would make sense that people look to the water there um in order to make their offerings to sort of beg and plead the gods to to uh, give them a bit of a break and 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 um look favorably on them in their lives and and so and a lot of these offerings are the ones that survive, survive because they're made of metal, so they haven't rotted away. And they include, among many other things, arms and armour. Quite impressive, beautiful arms and armour found in the Thames, found in Schlinkerig Bach on Anglesey is a particularly famous site. South Wales, oodles of places. Um, There's a huge, huge walkway found in Norfolk. Which yes, is many, many yes, there is, isn't well, there? Isn't yeah, yeah we're on either side of this, it was, yeah. it's, it was like a walkway to, to nowhere almost. Exactly. It, uh, it, it just took you out into the fens, into the marsh, so you could throw your stuff off. And and isn't there stuff people have sort of suggested that in terms of the wider landscape there, there was a certain sort of, I don't know if there was a physical line, but there's a point when on one side of it, that's where we live. On the other side of it, that's where we keep the dead. In fact, in fact, I think it was the body of water that the walkway goes out into. On the other side of that is all burial. On this side of it is where we live. So it's like going out to the brink of our world. To the underworld. Yeah, the underworld, the gods, yeah, is yeah. beyond. Because of the fairy Maybe. man sort of stories, yeah. The fairy man stories, exactly, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, and, and so, it's, yeah, certainly what's beneath the ground seems to have been this huge big deal within early british mythological belief and which does make sense i think when you when you consider that certainly from the neolithic or late mesolithic onwards then people are dependent upon the ground giving them food Absolutely. yeah and and yeah what yeah, they the ground helps what they get out of it as well we bury the dead the you know it Yes. Yeah, exactly. That, that's where I think, you know, we get things like the agricultural focus gods have come from. You know, the, the, you, know you had your, your painting of gods, and then when sort of hunter-gathering stopped and, and we started farming, there's a whole new set of gods that have to be worshipped to help bring forward crops, which we were yes, talking about again yeah, in the Fotherlands and that. Okay, yeah. so... um. Before we we go, we've got one more story I'd like to touch on. And we talked about water. And whilst I'm not afraid of maidens in the water, I am afraid of beasts that you call knuckers. 
Ah, uh, yes, the Naka, the Sussex monster of the water. Yes. Indeed. So tell us yes. about some Nuckers. Well, Naka. so this is some, since I came to live in Sussex is when I discovered um, about the Nuckers. But um, it does seem that all along the the south coast the, uh, in Sussex, um, and sort of the the coastal plain between the downs and the sea, then people had these beliefs that certain pools of water, which are always sort of slightly eerie places, were knucker holes, which is where knuckers lived. And knuckers were, and some stories make them sound a bit like dragons. Some stories make them sound like slimy, slug-like things. But they were, they were beasties, basically. And you didn't want to go too close to the water because a knucker would come and get you. And so it might be just a very simple kind of parental control kind of reflex. Um, but, um, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's the tale, that there are these And there, some of them are said to be bottomless. And there's Liminster is the one with the most famous story. And I tell the Liminster Nucker story on my <laughs> on my CD, should you be interested. Um, and yeah, it's it's really interesting that it was such a, a big part of um Sussex folk belief at some time. But but what people have also pointed out is that the word nucker is very similar to other Germanic speaking um, traditions about water beasties. So there's uh, Nixies and um, the Nikor as well. Um, and one of those two words, I, I get confused because in Tolkien's translation of Beowulf, then he says Nixie. I don't think that's actually the word that's used in Beowulf, but there is a very similar word used for the um, the, the water snakes um, in the pool um, that you, the, the um, Grendel through in and out of his home under the ground um uh and um up in um uh scandinavian countries then i know there is a tradition i think it's in the faroe islands or iceland about the i'm not pronouncing it right but the nook i think n o with a line through it k k um which is some sort of water horse monster thing and in Orkney, which is obviously heavily settled by um, Scandinavians, then they have the, uh, uh, if I'm saying this right, Nuklavi, I think it's called. And then in other English things as well, and I found uh, Ruth Tong's amazing co collection, Forgotten Folk Tales of the English Counties, which is worth looking up. Then she tells a couple of stories um, from elsewhere, I think Herefordshire, if I'm remembering it right, where there is a beastie in the water called Nicky Nicky Nye as well. Um, and so it does seem to be there. There was this sort of, presumably it all comes from the same linguistic concept, that, um, which was related to a cultural concept in Germanic belief, where there were things, nasty things in the water called that, be, that sounded a bit like nook and in sussex they became the nucker but what but what i find very interesting is is the is the contrast there with the flake maidens because in welsh tradition then what comes out of the water is not to be taken lightly but it's it's a source of wonder um it, it, this is this, these are amazing beings um, who bring all this wonderful rich the, the wealth of farm animals that they can bring with them and they're beautiful and they make their husband so happy until the husband mess it up and, and they they go back again so i mentioned Gwilym morris baird earlier who has a website celtic source online and and um does podcasts and, and vlogs under the name celtic source he he is an uh, incredibly knowledgeable scholar who draws connections between these lake maidens and with Rhiannon again, and uh, the, the appearance of horses in their stories and accidents to do with horses often associated with them having to um, go back under the ground, um, or under the water rather. Um, and so, so yeah, potentially again, there's this link there with, with ancient British gods, but it does make me think that so you can actually see a kind of the 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 almost the geological strata of belief there that there in in the Celtic fringes there's this uh, belief in what comes out of the water is powerful but kind of can be good if you treat it with respect but then in G the Germanic speaking areas the the areas of most Germanic settlement anyway then it's it's a, it's a beastie instead that has parallels with things elsewhere and in fact you know there are other freshwater mermaids as i've seen them called um in other english stories which might, which might have different names like jenny green teeth or um ellinge ellet is another um sussex one ellinge means kind of freaky eerie okay. um 
uh, who, so they have different names, but again, they are uh, monstrous women who live in the water, who are not nice, and who, with with their long spindly fingers and their slime encrusted teeth, will drag you down into the the, the your doom. You know, um, yeah. So so yeah, possibly two different two two different cultural traditions in this wonderful mel- melting pot that is British folklore. Exactly, and that is a. A perfect way to end, I think. <laughs> we've, we've touched on some really great myths and great stories. Uh, do you want to tell people uh, when you'll see these out or how to get hold of it? Yes, yes. So I will be. Um, you can get pre-orders of it um, from my website, which is johnthestoryteller.com. John yep, yep. is J O N. There we are. Thank you. Um, if you go there, johnthestoryteller.com slash shop. In fact you'll be able to pre-order it there. And if you're watching this YouTube video at some point way in the future um, and I'm looking back at such amazing curiosities, um, then um, then it will probably just be for sale from my shop. Um, or if you see me at a festival or any other sort of gig um, in person hereabouts uh, or thereabouts or wherever, then I will have some copies for sale as well. So, um, yes, and it will be, gosh... Not more than a tenner, certainly. Marvellous. Value for money. <laughs> John Mason, it is always a pleasure to talk to you. Really it's fascinating. It's a pleasure to talk to you as well, or you, Mr. Craig and Ford. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank, Thank you. Take care, okay, take care. Take care.